This morning's scripture is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verses 1 through 11, at the potter's house. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaking from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warned, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. Morning, church. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Those joining us online, hello to you, as well as those that will watch this later, hello to you as well, and welcome to our worship here on this other Lenten day. Yay! I saw the sun coming through, which I'm going to pretend it's warm out there. I don't know about you, but for those in Florida or wherever you're watching us from, we're jealous, we love you, but we wish we were with you. Uh, so as we're here today, before we get to the sermon proper, we just had a couple things I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first is, is that we have a first set of dates for the first mission trip. Yay. Yay, 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 yay. Uh, and so of course uh, we do know that uh, we'll be sending uh, Jeff and David to Liberia here in, in May, at the end of May, but also in June, uh, specifically June 9th through the 14th, uh, we're going to be taking a trip down to Florida, uh, to Port St. Joe. Uh, so we're going to have science here coming shortly, but I want you to just go ahead, if you have that available in your calendar, go ahead and mark it out. Now, if, unless you want to fly, there is going to be a day of travel before and after. So really the dates are June 8th through the 15th, so just to kind of give you a heads up on that. A lot more details coming through. We're also looking for a second trip somewhere in July and August. Details of that have yet to be worked out, but I do want to just put that before you as something you can go ahead and mark your calendars for, and as we prepare to move forward uh, with that. As far as uh, something else I want to let you know about as a church, we are going to be hosting something called an ERT training. You probably saw this little bulletin flyer in your bulletin. That's how we're done. But you saw this bulletin flyer here today. And it's an ERT. What this is is early response team training. It's going to be here at our church. And this is not just for those going on the mission trip, but you'll be really benefited if you do go on it. Uh, this is also for anybody who wants to do things like if we have a tornado a couple counties away or even a county away or even in this county. And there's a disaster response call, and they, you know, they could come in and they block it off and say no one can go in. They allow certain groups to go in and help. This training, you get your badge to be part of those groups that go in and help. And what would be really cool is if we had enough people do this, at any point, we could on any given day, whenever there's something bad that happens, we could just say, hey, we're going to meet at the church 10 a.m. Anybody that has this training that can come, meet us there. We're going to grab a group and we're just going to go and go chainsaw logs or move things and do all sorts of stuff. And this is the training that gives you that official badge to be part of that. So it's really helpful for that. But if you're going on the mission trip, I want to recommend that you do it. You don't have to. But I recommend that you would go to this because part of the training is sitting with people who have been in the disaster. And it's a lot less, uh, from what I understand, it's a lot less about here's how a chainsaw works and how to do that than it is about here's how to sit with someone who's just lost everything. Here's how to minister to them. Here's the things to not say. Here are the things that bring comfort. Here are the things to do and act. And so it's really useful information, really, in all genres of life, but especially for those that are going to be going on our trips coming up. So do you want to put that before you? It is here at the church. If you're not able to go to that or don't want to, but you still want to help, we do need help making lunches, and uh, we got to do a little breakfast thing for them and all that type of stuff. Uh, Charlene Nutter is going to be my point of contact there, so you can get a hold of Charlene. 
and uh, she's going to be uh, helping out with that. But we do need to actually put on a little hosting that morning as far as different groups coming in. It's not just our church. There'll be other churches in the district and the conference that are available to come that day, too. Sign-ups, you can find that little sheet. It'll tell you where to go to sign up, but you just go to the annual conference webpage and see the, the flyer there. You just click on it, and you can sign up through that way. Be help us contact the office. With all that being said, woo, it's lit. You guys pumped? Now, we had, a, we had a pretty heavy one last week, and uh, it's still heavy this week, but it starts off at least nice and fun. How many of you like pottery? Yeah? Yeah. How many of you, like, have actually been at the potter's wheel and tried to make pottery? Yeah, I don't know why I I should have had you do the sermon for me, honestly. But anyway, so my wife loves all sorts of art stuff but loves pottery. I remember when I was a kid, you know, I've only really been at the potter's wheel, like, once or twice in my life. And I was young enough that, like, watching the table spin was almost more fun than actually trying to make the stuff. And watching it go super fast, and had the little, I had the one where you could like, kind of press it and make it go faster. And watching it spin off was sometimes more fun than actually trying to do the pot. So I may have had those days. But I remember, right, when I actually finally did get to the point where I was like, all right, I've used myself enough. I'm actually going to try to make this masterpiece of a pot. I remember, you know, you get the bill going, and you put it in. It just doesn't do anything, right? I like, you know, you watch the masters do it, it's just like, and they're doing all these things, and then you try to do it, it's just like, it's just a loaf, right? <laughs> no matter what, it's like it just goes up and it flings around and flies off and does all these fun things. I remember I never got the hang of it. I had a lot of fun trying, but nonetheless, I never did. Now my wife, I'm going to tell a little story of my wife, she had pottery lessons uh, for a little bit and, uh, and had a lot of fun. So I have, I almost brought it today, but your pastor is nervous because he's sometimes uh, a klutz especially in the morning, and she gave me a piece of pottery, and I didn't want to bring it in because I was too afraid I'd break it. So maybe I'll take a picture and bring it for you next week. But uh, anyways, I have some pottery that my wife has made for me, and uh, she, but she, I remember her telling me the story, but she was taking this class, and it was kind of like the old-fashioned way of doing pottery, so there were certain things you do that you just have to know to be a master pottery that she was learning from. And they were doing it, uh, doing her things, and she was telling me that it's really unique because when you, when you really get into doing pottery and doing it well, you notice the clay fights back. I thought it was such an interesting thing, you know, the animate object fighting back to you. And I remember, you know, you tell me that, and I remember it just kind of like stuck with me, like, the clay fights back. And it's the master potter that's able to take whatever this clay is and just over time just make something beautiful out of it. And that, you know, sometimes the clay itself determines what you can make out of it. You can feel kind of the, the strength of it. You can feel the, the, you know, flexibility of it, if you will. You can feel and just inner pieces of what it's made of and know that this can't make a big jar or this can't make something small. It needs to be something of this because this is what it's made of. And what's really cool is our scripture here today, Jeremiah is brought by God to do something. And what's really unique about Jeremiah, there's lots of prophets in, in the Old Testament they say lots of different things. A lot of some of them are very similar to Jeremiah. But what's unique about Jeremiah is God always gives him like a visual aid, if you will. A lot of the prophets would just say, okay, you know, like a shepherd doing this, and just kind of imagery. God calls Jeremiah, he says, hey, I don't want you just to say this. I want you to go down to the potter's house, right? I want you to look at the potter being made. And if you've ever seen a master, it's just amazing. They just, you know, they put the lump of clay on after they kneaded it and done all the different things, and they keep this wheel spinning, and then they get a little bit of water, and they just slowly add a little bit of water, and it's this little lump, and all of a sudden they just... And they get the little tools, and then they like even add. I mean, this is little marks that they make with their hand crafts and shit. And the clay just melds into their hands. Just and it just you look at it, you're like, that is so cool. Hey, it's just it's like watching a campfire. Like you can't put your eyes off it, but then too, it just makes it look so easy until you try it and realize this is really hard stuff to do, right? <laughs> and I love this imagery because Jeremiah is told, hey, go down to the potter's house. I want to tell Israel something. But I want them to come and see what it is you're talking about. I want them to have this imagery. And before them, as the scripture said, remember the story, it's just a real quick one, is Jeremiah goes down and he sees this potter. And the potter has this lump and is making something out of it. And it just doesn't work. So what does the potter do? Lump of clay again. And then what does the potter do? Makes it into something different. And Jeremiah, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah that day. 
But I wanted to pause real quick because this is such a good devotional passage. I don't know if you've ever really thought about your life specifically. In the Christian life as we're surrendering to God, part of what we do is just like that lump of clay that sometimes fights God or sometimes surrenders. The master work that God's making in our life, when we surrender, he's able to make something more glorious, something better, something bigger for this world that points to his grace and his love. And so it's just a neat little devotional thing, first of all, but I wanted to go past that because as, as great as that is, this passage actually is not just for individuals. Specifically, what the Lord says in this passage, and I don't want to, if you've ever been doing a devotional or anything, this has really spoken to you kind of personally, I don't want to take away from that, that's not my point, because that's still accurate, right? This is still a good imagery for how God shapes our life. But specifically in this passage, what Jeremiah is being told is not, hey, you individual, shape up, let me inform you. It's, hey, you nations, people groups, countries, if you will, nowadays we call them. Let me form you. Let me, let me shape you. Let me direct your paths. Let me do good for you. Let me intend a purpose for you that is so good. And let me shape and form you for the rest of the world to see my glory through you. Now, specifically, this is for Israel, right? Because or really Judah at this point, because Israel is pretty much gone. And so Judah is, is there in this tribe, and they have this been going their own way. We've been talking about it a bit here. I just want to rehash this for those that haven't. They've been going their own way and basically saying, God, we don't care what you want to do. We're going to do what we want, and you're just going to just keep loving us because that's what you do, and you keep forgiving us. Uh, but we're not even going to ask for forgiveness anymore. We're just going to blatantly do what we want to do and don't care what you tell us to do. And so God eventually says, guys, enough. And after warning, after warning, after all these different things he's tried to do throughout time and time and time, he finally lets them be captured and carried off, and Jerusalem gets destroyed. And so this imagery, he's pointing to Judah once again. Hey, Judah. Hey, Israel. The sense of Israel. You are my kingdom. I have made a covenant with you. Look at this potter. If the clay doesn't work out to what he has intended for, you know what he's going to do? He's going to smash it. And he's going to reform it for another purpose. And the warning there is really dire, isn't it? For, for Judah. Hey, Judah, I am about to redo this pottery. Judah, I am about to just let this collapse and reform and knead out the impurities once again to reshape you. But there's something else that God says there. Because in the middle of it, I just want to remind you what he says. Uh, it says right here in the scripture... It says, O house of Israel, this is chapter 18, verse 5. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, like the clay in the hand of a potter, so you are in my hand? O house of Israel, if at any time I announce to a nation or kingdom to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation repents of its evil, I will relent and not inflict on a disaster I have planned. If at another time I announce to a nation or kingdom to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight, does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended to do for it. You see, it's kind of interesting because there's little snippets in Scripture where suddenly you realize, you know, if you're reading Scripture for the first time, you're just thinking about how many times God's directly speaking to the Israelites. But then you get the bigger picture sometimes. That God's not just worried about the Israelites. God's worried about all the nations, all the peoples. And he's got plans for them, not just Israel. And of course, we as Christians know that because we see Jesus Christ come and the, the redemption of the world, the Gentiles get included with the Israelites and all these different things. But at this time, none of that's happened yet. And God's telling Jeremiah, hey, if a nation ever comes and I have purposes to destroy it because it's done evil, but it repents, I'm going to shape it. If it molds to my hand, I'm going to shape it. I'm going to make it into a purpose and do good to it. Or a nation that I brought up does, that I brought up to you do it ever turns and does evil and doesn't relent when I come and warn it. And it just keeps fighting and fighting and fighting, and it's just not for my purpose. Water. So. And what's unique about this specific passage is it directly applies not only then, but today. Because this isn't just a word for Israel, this is a word for all the nations. Which you and I, when we come to the United States and our country, and we weren't necessarily founded upon, you know, following Jesus Christ specifically, but we were founded upon many of those ideals, weren't we? 
And these got encoded to who we were. In some very, very powerful, deep ways. And I, as your pastor, I, I look at this and I just sometimes wonder if we're getting off track and if we're going to lose the very core things that made our country great. And here's an example of what I mean by that. And, and some of it's obvious, you know, like a lot of pastors would talk about school or prayer at schools or different things like that, or, you know, courthouses having the Ten Commandments brought down. But I want to point something almost super deep, super, 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 super deep in who we are. That if you stop thinking about us, it's really starting to be challenged. In the Declaration of Independence, you remember the famous words? Right? The famous ones that are always brought. We hold these truths what? Jesus. That's right. You, know, you were taught well in school. Do you remember the next line? That all men are created equal. Now, it doesn't stop there. It actually keeps going. But I'm going to stop there for a minute. Where did that come from? This idea that everybody is created equal. Think about how ludicrous that sounds if you stop and think about it. Isn't it obvious all people are not created equal? Some have better gifts, some are better, more, are more athletic, some are you know, smarter, some are just given just the ability to make things happen, some are char like charming, some are more beautiful. All people are not created equal. In fact, I was uh, listening to, uh, well, this was a while ago, but it was, you know, I've told you before I get sick of my radio stations and so I just turn on all sorts of stuff. So I listened to NPR for like a few years and uh, I remember this one person they had on from Australia and he was just coming at the United States of America for this line. Because his point was exactly that. It is stupid to believe all people are created equal. That's not true at all. What we need to say is all people need equal opportunity to prove how much they're worth. Right? And so that was his point. And he said, you know, in Australia, this is how we look at it, blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't say everybody's created equal, blah, blah, blah. And what's interesting about that is where did this line come from? Because you know the next one. Do you remember? I had to be reminded. <laughs> I had to look it up and be reminded. Because in my memory, I was really surprised by this, this, this uh, when I was looking this up. In my memory, when I was taught in school, all men are created equal, and it says, and are, you know, given certain unalienable rights, but among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's how I remember it. Exactly. You know what, when I went back and looked, you know what it actually says and why the United States Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal? It doesn't say all people need equal opportunity. It's because this, it's actually, this is the actual wording of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Did you hear it? Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. You see, those rights and those truths that are self-evident are only evident if there's a creator. And only evident if the country that's free chooses to follow that said creator. And so what's so unique about our country is that we were given these ideals that are kind of codified in deep, deep, dark, deep, not dark ways, but deep, deep ways that are so fundamental. If you think about a world that's based on equal opportunity, what happens to those that aren't very needed? What happens to those that aren't free, those that aren't athletic, those that aren't smart, those that are given opportunities and squander them, those that just can't make things happen, those that aren't charming, those that are just mediocre and everything, do they have value? If you stop and think about our, our world, it doesn't surprise me that one of the biggest needs for young teenagers in the studies, I think I mentioned this to you before, one of their biggest priorities in life is to be famous. You know why? Because if you're famous, you're good at something. It means you have value, even if it's bad. You have value because you had an opportunity and you seized it. If you really think about our country in so many ways, that's changed, has not it? I saw this when I was in college and people were doing, you know, you'd be doing all sorts of good stuff to help people, right? And it was really interesting because the mindset had changed a little bit. And I was surprised at how many times you'd be talking with someone, you'd be doing this great thing, soup kitchen, or you'd be like helping out and doing something. I mean, you'd be doing all sorts of really good work. And all of a sudden, the person would say something like, oh yeah, you know, why, are, you know, why are you guys, how'd you get involved with this? And they said, oh, I just wanted to look good on my resume. 
right? Because it was all about taking your opportunity and using it to become further. Which is totally different than all men are created equal. Of course, we expand that not just men and women and all that, kids and everybody. All people are created equal. And so I wonder if our nation continues on those paths and continues to sort of really become more atheistic in our understanding and more, you know, uh, sort of a little more secular in our understanding in every category of every piece of life. Is that something we'll lose? And if we lose that, will we look at those that are downtrodden and those that don't use their opportunities, will we look at them as less? Will we eventually not care for them? Will we eventually dehumanize them? Will we eventually let them, whatever happens to them, while well, they didn't earn the right to be real citizens? They could, right? We know in history, history has taught us many things, and that is one thing that could possibly go that way. And so one of the challenges I have for us is to pray as a country that there's probably all sorts of deep ways that we could just expand upon, but there's just one, right? Do all people have worth? Just because of who they are. Just because they exist. And that's self-evident. There's a creator. And it's not self-evident. This is just a mishap of the cosmos and we're here today. And so in many ways, you know, our country can stand at many crossroads, but maybe this is one for us. Will we continue to believe that all people, even the ones on death row, have died? Or is it simply we earn our value by taking opportunities and capitalizing on them? May the Lord bless us as we ponder these things. May the Lord bless us as we, once again, come as a nation, surrender our lives, and ask God to form us and shape us and make us into something different. Lord, we come here today and we ask, Lord, for forgiveness in so many different ways. We, as a country, not just ourselves, but the people groups that we surround ourselves with, we all always shall fall short. And God, you are gracious and forgive. But in so many ways, sometimes we hear the Lord of saying, let's go off and do our own thing. And sometimes they're very overt, but sometimes... There are little tiny things that make such a big difference. As we read your scripture, it's clear without a shadow of a doubt that you made each and every single person, and each and every single person has the fingerprint of God on them. Lord, help us as a country to reclaim that. And help us as a country not to put value in people based upon what they do or what kind of talents they have. Help us to place value because, Lord, they are your creation. Lord, help us to once again reclaim that truth. God, we're here today. We pray all this in your name. Amen.